Good evening, everyone. My name is Merle DaCosta, and I'm a pelvic health physiotherapist at uh, Aramosa Physiotherapy in Georgetown and Acton. Um, today, we are doing this recording for you uh, just based on the webinar that we were hosting um, last night. So without further ado, um, the talk is on pelvic health physiotherapy and why it's important. Um, so the first thing I thought we would discuss is maybe some of the common misconceptions that we do hear uh, uh, just in social media uh, when we're out and about with friends and family, actually not doing that right now, um, but uh, or also in the clinic. Um, so one of the big things we hear is, is it normal to uh, leak urine as we get older? Um, and as we age, um, and uh, and that is definitely very common, uh, but it is not normal. And definitely know that uh, with pelvic health physiotherapy, um, it can be uh, resolved. Is it normal to have urinary leakage after childbirth? So again, it's another one that is very common to have, um, and usually uh, will happen within the first six weeks of childbirth, um, just because of the, the the weight of the baby that we've carried. Um, so again, it's very common, but it's not normal. And again, uh, can be treated effectively. Is it normal to have pain with sexual intercourse? So again, this is very common, especially after childbirth and sometimes as we age. Um, it is uh, definitely normal to, or excuse me, common to have pain with sexual intercourse, but it's not normal. And again, there are things that we can do to treat it. Um, is it normal to have urinary leakage with exercise? So we hear a lot of people talking about uh, when they're um, when they're jumping on the tra their kid's trampoline, if they're trying to run after their kids, that they do have some leakage. Um, and again, um, it's definitely common, but not normal. And again, just know that there is a lot of things that we can do to treat it effectively. And then finally, pelvic organ prolapse. Is it common amongst women? And again, yes, again, very, very common. About 50% of us um, in that child, uh, childbearing um, age group will have uh, pelvic organ prolapse. And sometimes, again, we don't even, uh, we're not even aware that it's present, um, but it is, okay? And again, something that we can do to take care of that. Okay, so what we're going to talk about tonight is uh, to understand what the core and the pelvic floor muscles are. We're going to take a look at what bladder function is. We're going to look at the epidemiology, or like I like to call it, the stats. Uh, we'll look at signs and symptoms of pelvic floor issues. Um, talk a little bit about the pelvic floor assessment and what we do. Okay, we'll look at the conditions treated, and we'll look at treatment. Okay, so the core, when we think about the core, a lot of us will think about just the, the abdominal muscles, right? And I think that's pretty common in what you see in the fitness industry. Um, but the core is actually made up of four different muscle groups. The first one is the diaphragm, and I call the diaphragm the roof of the house. So the diaphragm is our big breathing muscle. So as we breathe in, what happens is you have a dome-shaped muscle that comes from here. As you, as you breathe in, um, that muscle tends to lengthen. Okay, the next muscle is um, wraps around the big abdominal canister, we call it, um, and it's known as the transverse abdominus. Let me just move my little diagram here out of the way. So that, that um, transverse abdominus, I like to call the spanks of the body, and it helps to provide stability um, to, uh, to that abdominal region. Okay, the next uh, one is the pelvic floor muscle. Uh, muscles, I should say, and there's uh, three layers of muscles that make up the pelvic floor. So there's numerous uh, muscles. Um, and basically what it does is it extends from the front or the pubic bone all the way back to the tailbone. Okay. And the one that we commonly forget about is the multifidus. And these are uh, small little muscles that are found um, along the vertebrae and they span from the, uh, the sacrum or the base of that tailbone all the way up actually into the neck as well. So those are the four muscles that make up the core, okay? When we think of the pelvic floor muscles, we actually think about like a toned hammock Okay, um, a tone hammock is something that actually when you go to sit in, it will, it's able to absorb some shock. Okay, it, it can recoil back depending on the weight or how many people are sitting on it. It's got a little bit of give to it. What we don't want is a droopy hammock. Okay, a droopy hammock is something when we have pressure or changes in movement, we'll actually not absorb it. It will kind of like lower down till you're almost hitting the ground, which wouldn't be comfortable. 
Okay. And what are pelvic floor muscles do? As we had talked about, it expand, it extends from that pubic bone. Let me see if I can find my arrow here. Um, so it extends from the pubic bone and it wraps all the way around uh, to the tailbone. And it kind of um, moves from one of the sits bones to the other sits bone. So it's almost forms like a, even a triangle as well. Okay, so the pelvic floor muscles are important and it provides a lot of uh, important functions. Okay, so the first one is what they call sphincteric. So it helps to maintain our bowel and bladder control. So it's involved in the opening and closure of both the urethra and the anus, anal canal. It plays an important role in sexual function um, in that it uh, plays a good role in, in terms of sensation and allowing us to have pleasure. Um, some of my clients will usually talk about, um, usually as a secondary piece where, um, you know, when they're having sexual intercourse with their partner, they may not have um, orgasms. Um, usually it's because sometimes that tone of those muscles is not very good. They're kind of that saggy hammock. Um, so as they tend to st uh, strengthen their pelvic floor muscles. Sometimes um, the added benefit of the pelvic floor physio is that they start to have um, improved uh, sexual sensation. Okay. The other, um, one of the other functions of the pelvic floor muscle is some pump. Okay. And what this means is it helps to move lymphatic fluid um, within the actual tissues. Okay, um, one of our big, um, big um, functions of the pelvic floor includes the support. So what it does, it actually supports our organs, um, particularly the bladder, the uterus and the rectum. And then finally, it, um, it's part of the core muscles and it helps to provide stability through the low back hips and your pelvis area. Okay, so when we think about the pelvic floor and the core muscles, we think about, about the breath. Okay, and how we know that those four muscles all work together is when we take a breath in and our diaphragm lowers. So I'm gonna kind of bring my hands here uh, just so that you can see them. What happens is as that diaphragm lengthens with the, as the lungs fill with air, if our pelvic floor is here, what it does is it tends to lengthen and those abdominal muscles also, I wouldn't say necessarily relax, but I would say they would lengthen as well. Okay, as we breathe out, what happens is everything recoils back and our pelvic muscles contract as our abdominal muscles engage as well. Okay, so how we think of this is as a piston. So as that diaphragm and the pelvic floor muscles definitely work like a piston moving up and down in that abdominal cavity. Um, and what's really important to note is that these muscles should act reflexively. They should be able to turn on and off without us actually thinking about them. Okay, so Typically, most of us will not have any dysfunction, right, as children, okay, and as we get older, um, most of the times, uh, most people will actually see dysfunction happen usually after childbirth or as we get older. Now, what we're noticing, though, is that there is a subset of that of, of ladies within their um, their 20s um, who do a lot of, say, CrossFit and running who are having some issues. And again, usually it's because um, this core breath is not working effectively. Okay, so one of the other things to really understand is how that bladder functions. Okay, and I call the bladder, um, essentially, it's like a storage tank. All right, and it's a storage tank, which actually has a muscle called the detrusor that actually sits around that, that tank. Okay, so as you're eating and drinking all day, what happens is the bladder tends to fill with urine, right? So the byproducts of the kidneys kind of dump into that, uh, into that bladder. And as that bladder starts to hold more and more fluid, what happens is there's a stretch in that detrusor muscle that surrounds, surrounds it. When you get to almost a cup of water, 250 mils of water, what happens is your, um, that stretch of that muscle or the detrusor muscle sends signals to the brain to let your body know that, hey, it's time to go to the washroom, okay? And so that's typically that first urge to go, okay? Usually when most of us have that first urge to go, what we do is then say, hey, it's time to go to the washroom, so we go and find that washroom. Okay, um, as we go to sit down, what happens then is our body recognizes that, all right, Merle has sat down on the toilet, so it's time to allow those pelvic floor muscles to relax and uh, time for me to, to empty out the bladder. Okay, and then that cycle goes again, all right? There's a number of different things that can cause that to dysfunction 
to be dysfunctional. Um, some of those include, you know, the just in case piece. So, you know, we know that we're going on uh, a long car ride. So what we do is that we um, go to the water, the bathroom just to go just in case. The problem is, is when that when we start to do that more and more regularly, what happens is that bladder starts to think that instead of you know, waiting till that there's one cup of water within our bladder, um, we feel that, it, or it realizes that, oh, you know what, Merle likes to go to the washroom when there's only, say, you know, a um, hundred mils of, of water in her bladder. So what happens then is that brain, when it gets to that hundred mils, it gives me that signal to say, go to the washroom. So when then you go to the washroom, you realize, oh, there wasn't a lot to go. All right, so it's really, really important that we start to recognize that we only go to the washroom when it's telling us. So why is pelvic health important? Okay, so, uh, and this is where the stats come in. So we know that 3.3 million Canadians will have urinary incontinence, um, and that's one in four women. And we sometimes forget that men have pelvic floors as well. So we know that one in nine men um, will also have incontinence as well, okay? Um, chances of urinary incontinence in women. So, um, you know, and we had just mentioned this, that 20 to 30% of uh, young adults, so usually below the age of 35, will have urinary incontinence. As we get into that middle age, it's 30 to 40, and then later age, it's 30 to 50. Okay, um, there are three different types of urinary leakage that include stress urinary leakage. Um, that is when we uh, laugh, cough, sneeze, and jump. Um, mixture is uh, where there is a mixture of um, urge incontinence um, and the stress, okay, and then again urge urinary incontinence, so that's where we feel like we've got to go and we just can't hold it, okay. Um, we know 50% of women at some point in, the, in their life cycle will experience some um, urinary incontinence and 33% will develop regular problems. Okay, so the key factor here is to know that there is a direct and indirect cost that's associated with urinary incontinence. I was trying to look for some newer stats um, uh, and couldn't find any, but in 2014, um, the cost was $5.3 billion. Uh, so it was probably a total of, say, if we were looking at um, uh, individuals, would be about $6,000 a year um, were reported per year. Okay, um, spent on um, spent on incontinence products, um, and we know that the average cost of pelvic health physio is about physiotherapy is about five hundred to seven hundred dollars a person. Okay, so when we talk about um, talk about urinary incontinence, we also have to realize that there are some social consequences that can be detrimental um, to people's health. Okay, and usually because uh, when people start to um, to start to leak. Um, there can be decreased self-esteem, right? We're really embarrassed uh, because, you know, we've, uh, we've leaked in our, pa our pants. Uh, we don't want our friends to know. Uh, we start to feel bad about ourselves. Um, and as a result of this, we will also then start to get depressed. Uh, we may not be going out as much. We may be limiting how far we go. Um, we're, we're usually then planning as to, you know, where is that next washroom? Um, you know, are we able to stop in? And we may stop um, going out altogether. Okay, and as I mentioned, it impedes that social activity. Okay, um, and we also know that physical activity declines um, as well. All right, and we stop doing our typical activities of daily living. Okay, now there's a number of risk factors and I really like this diagram. So, you know, one of the risk factors they had in there is prostate surgery. And I think we're mainly focusing on women here, um, but just know, as I mentioned, that uh, males do have pelvic floors as well. Um, we know as we get older, um, definitely um, our muscles tend to weaken and it can be a risk factor. Uh, we know that with pregnancy and childbirth, depending on birth trauma, um, because we carry babies and load for nine months, it can definitely impact our pelvic floor. Um, genetics uh, can be a big thing. Uh, there's a lot of research now talking a lot about um, um, our connective tissue um, and how it can impact or be impacted um, uh, from your uh, from uh, family member to family member. Um, hysterectomies as well um, can also impact our um, pelvic health um, because of the change in hormonal levels. Um, any sort of pelvic floor injury, 
and that can be classified in birth trauma as well, um, increase in abdominal pressure, and we'll go over this a little bit more as we uh, as we kind of move through the presentation. Uh, chronic constipation is another thing because the load placed on the pelvic floor. Um, intense physical effort, so you know, uh, lots of running, um, crossfitters, um, obesity is another one, and also a history of uh, back pain as well. Okay, so some of the common signs and symptoms that we hear in the clinic include um, urinary leakage from running, jumping, coughing, sneezing, sitting to standing. Um, we'll um, hear people um, talk about painful intercourse, uh, frequent urination, the inability to hold urine, they just can't make it to the washroom, um, dribbling after they urinate, sensitivity at the vaginal opening or just pain and discomfort. Um, difficulties keeping the tampons or the diva cup in, feeling pressure in their vagina, and sometimes a burning or stabbing pain in the pelvic region. Okay, so conditions that we treat um, include um, urinary incontinence, so urge, stress, uh, and mixed incontinence. Uh, we've got plain painful bladder uh, syndrome or interstitial cystitis, uh, painful intercourse, uh, also known as dyspareunia, uh, pelvic organ prolapse, fecal incontinence, tailbone pain, pudendal nerve variability, vestibular dyna, dyna, excuse my yeah, pronunciation there, uh, frequent uh, urinary tract infection, uh, sorry, urinary tract infections, constant uh, constipation, rectal pain, and rectus diastasis, to name a few. So what is pelvic health physiotherapy? So um, with pelvic health physiotherapy, what we do is we actually will um, start with a subjective assessment, okay? And typically I find with my subjective assessment, um, we're kind of unpacking um, a whole health history. So we're looking um, to understand, um, you know, is what brought you into the clinic? Okay, um, and what are the um, what are uh, some of the signs and symptoms that you're uh, demonstrating? Um, we want to take a t understand any medications that you're taking, um, and we want to kind of also know a detailed history of any um, injuries that you sustained, um, and also taking a look at um, how it's impacting your life. We then move into um, an objective assessment where we take a look at um, your low back, your mid back, um, your hips and your pelvis. Um, we take a look at how you're moving and functioning. So, um, you know, we may be looking at how you move from sitting to standing, how you uh, get up and off, um, you know, a treatment table, how you roll over. Um, we'll take a look at, um, you know, what they call an active straight leg raise, where we're looking for contribution of how other muscle groups contribute to your pelvic floor. Um, we'll take a look at your breathing. Um, if you've had any scar tissue, we will want to see how those scars move because those scars can also impact, um, you know, how the, the muscles and the tissues below you move. Um, we'll look for any nerve involvement and then look for any sort of local contributors that could be uh, creating some of the issues that you're coming in to see us. Okay, so an internal assessment is then also performed as we uh, as we go through and do more of what we call or think about an orthopedic assessment. Um, and that's to really assess the pelvic floor muscles, right? So to really understand, um, you know, are you able to contract them? Are you, um, how strong they are? Do they have endurance? Do you, are you able to maintain good tension and relaxation and to realize if there's any compensations? So a number of, the t a number of times when people come into the clinic, sometimes they just uh, don't know where their pelvic floor muscles are. Um, they don't know how to contract them or um, conversely, they may not know how to relax them. So they're holding so much tension in those muscles that they just can't relax them. So we try to, like I said, really look at a detailed um, assessment just to make sure that, um, um, that we can provide a proper treatment plan for you. Okay, so with pelvic floor function, as I was just mentioning, is that those muscles need to be able to contract they need to be able to relax, but we also need to be able to coordinate those that muscle function with other movements. So, you know, if we're lifting our babies up, if we're loading groceries into the um, into our car, if we're carrying groceries into the house, um, if we're cleaning, if we're going for a run, so just a variety of different activities. Okay, um, when we're talking about pelvic floor issues, there's usually two states um, that we will see. Um, so one where the muscles are weak, um, they have poor endurance and lengthened, that state is called hypotonic. Um, the other state that we'll typically see is where the muscles are weak, they've got 
poor relaxation, so you're not unable to let them relax, or they've got lots of tone in them, um, and they're very tight. And those are called um, hypertonic, okay? So um, as I mentioned, uh, with hypotonicity, which are the lengthened and weak muscles, um, typically we'll see stress urinary incontinence or pelvic organ prolapse. With hypertonicity, those tight and weak ones, um, usually it's urgent continence. Um, sometimes there's urgency, frequency, hesitation, or retention. You're unable to, um, you know, uh, release the uh, urine. Um, we'll have uh, pelvic pain or dyspareunia. Okay. So hypertonicity, uh, we think of stress urinary incontinence, and this is an incontinence that's associated with um, activities such as coughing, sneezing, laughing, or jumping. Uh, we know that pelvic floor physiotherapy should be the first line of treatment for stress incontinence, okay? We know that what the research shows is that 80 to 85% success rate with pelvic floor physio um, without actually having to go for surgery. Okay. Um, we also know that if women do have to go for surgery or they decide that that's what they would like to do, um, that you really do want to make sure that those pelvic floor muscles are strong um, and have enough tone so that they can also uh, support that surgical repair. Um, so most people's um, surgeries, uh, bladder lift surgeries will fail um, just simply because those pelvic floor muscles are not functioning. Okay. Um, we'll also see pelvic organ prolapse, okay? So this is where that bladder or the uterus or the rectum can actually fall into that vaginal cavity, okay? So um, there's quite a few women who will um, have a wide variety of symptoms. Actually, some women will not uh, demonstrate any symptoms and are definitely not aware that they have um, um, this happening. Um, so when I have um, any of my clients actually see um, their doctors for their PAPs, I actually have them, you know, ask the doctor because sometimes they won't disclose it, but just ask the doctor if they do actually have um, a pelvic organ prolapse because uh, we just want to make sure that that doesn't get worse. Okay, so some of the symptoms that people will report of pelvic organ prolapse um, includes a heaviness or a bulging of the vagina. Uh, they will have low back pain. Um, they'll talk about bladder and bowel dysfunction and sexual dysfunction. Okay, so this is quite the slide with lots of information. Um, as I mentioned um, at the start, 50% uh, of uh, women in the childbearing year um, age uh, will have um, experienced some sort of pelvic organ prolapse and there's different degrees of prolapse, okay? Um, not all women, as I mentioned, will have uh, or demonstrate symptoms. Okay, um, we know that uh, uh, symptoms um, are prevalent in three to 28% of the population. Um, uh, prolapse surgeries actually outnumber stress incontinence surgeries, but uh, by two to one, and most will uh, um, require uh, reoperation. So about 30% of them will require that to, uh, to be reoperated on. Um, we know that uh, there's uh, lots of research to show that pelvic organ training is to, uh, very effective in decreasing symptoms and the grade of prolapse, okay? Um, and as I mentioned, that there's different grades of prolapse. So there's a grade one, two, and three. Um, and um, pelvic floor physiotherapy, uh, which includes strengthening of the pelvic floor muscles, if indicated, um, uh, addressing posture, lifestyle modifications um, is kind of that first line of treatment, and that's what the research is demonstrating. Whereas grade four prolapse, and that's where those, that, those organs start to come out uh, and come up to the um, opening of the introitus, or grade five, which is where those organs start to exit the, uh, the vagina. What happens is that uh, um, typically that these um, these uh, these prolapses will actually require surgery um, because we're not able to actually reverse what's happening. Um, but we definitely know that uh, pelvic floor training pre and post surgically uh, would be beneficial. We also do have quite a large number of ladies who are also using pessaries uh, for support of their organs as well. So this is another way that they can be managing their symptoms as well. Okay, so here I'm just basically showing um, kind of what a normal um, um, a uterus, uh, or sorry, a normal uh, anatomy would look like. So we actually have the bladder, which sits in here. Um, we have the uterus and then we have the rectum. And this is the vag vagina, okay? 
this picture here basically shows that that bladder just because of the weakening of this abdominal wall, the bladder starts to fold into the vaginal cavity. Okay, in this one here, this is where there is a rectocele where the rectum starts to actually move into the vaginal cavity. And finally, this one here um, shows the uterine prolapse. So that uterus starts to descend into the vaginal cavity. Okay, um, I just wanted to briefly mention menopause as well. Um, so menopause is actually um, just another time in a woman's life for perimenopause and menopause, um, where what happens is there is a fluctuation, um, a, a big fluctuation in hormones. So our bodies start to produce less estrogen and progesterone. And these fluctuating hormones can actually influence a variety of different systems within the body. Okay, so as we get older, um, that fluctuating hormones can impact our cardiovascular system. So uh, leave us prone to heart attacks. Um, it influences our bone and skeletal system. So sometimes this is why uh, we develop osteoporosis. Uh, we'll, um, uh, it changes our metabolism. So what we notice is that uh, we tend to start to put on weight, even if we haven't changed what we're eating and how we're moving. Um, we can also influence our sexuality and that it can um, impact, uh, again, our, a decrease in our libido. Um, and then uh, when we think about the urinary system um, with women and um, menopause, uh, we can also have pelvic organ prolapse and also vaginal atrophy. Okay, so there can be a, a thinning of that vaginal tissue um, and a reduction in the motor units as we get older. Okay, so pelvic health physiotherapy is fantastic at helping to manage some of the local symptoms of menopause, which will include incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, and pain with sex. Okay, so that next state that we're going to be talking about is the hypertonic pelvic floor muscles, right? So these, are, this is that state where those muscles can be weak, um, they're tight, um, and they're also short. Okay, so um, as we mentioned, um, some of the symptoms that you'll have is uh, urinary urgency and frequency, um, where you're going to the washroom quite a bit. Um, we'll have chronic pain states, um, vulvodynia, interstitial cystitis, endometriosis. Um, we'll have urinary hesitation and retention where, you know, you go to the washroom, you feel like you have to go, you get up, you kind of do a jig, you sit back down, and then you're able to empty some more. Okay. Uh, dyspernia, vaginismus, um, and chronic constipation are all symptoms or signs, signs and symptoms. Um, with the hypertonicity or pelvic pain, um, typically, again, they're related to muscle tension and includes a sensitized nervous system. So sometimes our nervous system is that fight or flight response system. So sometimes uh, we're consistently in that uh, fight mode. Okay. Um, most individuals will also have uh, pain in their back, hips, and pelvic girdle. Um, and it's usually related to that tension in the pelvic floor muscles. Um, and again, um, that tight uh, and tight weakened pelvic floor muscle, um, they're not able to contract as strongly in response to increases in intra-abdominal pressure. So with coughing, laughing, and sneezing, and as a result, stress urinary incontinence will occur, okay? When we're working with people with hypertonic pelvic floors, um, what we find is that we really need to teach those people how to relax and lengthen those muscles before we begin to strengthen them. Okay, pelvic girdle pain um, is pain that exp is experienced in the back. Okay, so when we talk about the iliac crest, if we place our hands on the top of our hip bones, um, that is our iliac crest. So kind of the backside that extends below the buttock, but it can also wrap around into the groin. So this is what we classify as pelvic girdle pain. Um, very, very common in pregnant and postpartum women. And it's usually as a result of um, pelvic joint asymmetry. So sometimes we'll hear about one leg being longer than the other. Um, we may have uh, ligaments. Uh, ligaments are basically tissue that holds bone to bone. And so as uh, when we're pregnant, what happens is we develop a little bit of laxity to allow for that growing baby. Um, we can also have uh, ligament laxity in this area if we've ever been in car accidents or had some major trauma. Um, had had uh, one client who actually jumped off um, a roof <laughs> and kind of landed on the ground. And um, as a result, she had stretched out some of her ligaments, much like when we sprain our ankle or go over our ankle. But um, in this area, very, very hard to sprain ligaments. Okay. Um, and it can also be a result of weak and tight pelvic floor muscles. Okay, so again, in this, um, that pelvic lengthening, uh, pelvic floor lengthening um, kind of takes precedence. Um, and then we talk a lot about glute strengthening um, as well. 
Okay. With respect to sexual function and pain, um, the, the area between the vagina and the anus is called the perineum. And uh, we uh, lovingly call this place the Grand Central Station. Um, and that's because of the majority or a lot of the pelvic floor muscles attach and insert in this area. And sometimes that tissue um, becomes very immobile. Um, also, um, if we've had uh, ch children, um, we they will usually cut into that tissue and that um, scar can actually um, not allow that tissue to move very well um, and that can contribute to pain, okay? So usually uh, when we have uh, sexual function uh, or dysfunction and pain, um, usually it's because that there's lots of tension within those muscles um, as well. Okay, um, with a lot of our clients who do have this dysfunction, um, the doctors will you normally send you for a variety of different tests and like in uh, pelvic, um, pelvic ultrasounds, abdominal ultrasounds, they may do some blood work, but usually all of those tests come back negative. And again, usually it's usually the, it's more uh, mus muscular tension that can be contributing to that. Okay, uh, we know that 31% of most women after, um, um, after having their first baby will still have pain. Um, and with sexual intercourse, usually at about six months, okay. Um, but we know that those tears and incisions are usually healed by six to eight weeks, okay. So um, pain um, after that is usually commonly related to a short, tight pelvic floor. Um, it can also be related to changing um, changes in hormone levels as well. Okay, um, so when we think about um, um, postpartum periods, um, we really know that the uh, pelvic floor needs to be strong enough to support the, the, uh, the women's body as she begins to exercise again. Okay, uh, when you have that six week postpartum checkup, um, I really um, like um, my clients and uh, advocate for my clients to really talk to their doctor about actually having them um, check their abdominal region, making sure that they don't have any rectus diastasis. Uh, we also wanna make sure that they do do um, an internal assessment uh, where they check to make sure that that scar is healing well, that incision is moving well. Same thing if you've had a C-section as well, we wanna make sure that C-section scar is moving well. Um, you also wanna make sure that, um, you know, have them check that your pelvic floor is, is, is working well and functioning well, okay? Um, usually at about that six week postpartum mark, um, I usually try to encourage my clients to come in and see us, um, just again, so that we can make sure that your pelvic floor is functioning and that those muscles are working with all of your other muscles um, just before you start back to activity. Okay, um, just remember that activities such as running, abdominal crunch crunches, boot camp drills, weightlifting and Pilates, um, they can also increase pressure on the pelvic floor. So if that pelvic floor is function is, or pelvic floor muscles are not functioning appropriately, um, it may be that you're just not ready to go back to exercise. And you might have, um, you know, you might then develop incontinence and uh, prolapse, okay? So what we're looking for when people come into the clinic is a minimum of a grade three contraction. We also need to make sure that that pelvic floor muscle is working well with your abdominals and your glutes um, so that you're not having any sort of um, developed any sort of compensations, okay? So when you go back to, uh, to exercise. Um, one of the things I do point out to my clients now, so back in 2019, um, uh, some uh, physiotherapists out of, um, out of England um, or the United Kingdom uh, produced a return to run guidelines. Um, and so they are actually free. Um, all you actually have to do is uh, Google those uh, postpartum return to run guidelines. Uh, Tom Groom is one of the authors um, and you can actually get that. And it's actually got some great information there. Um, and I utilize this information, not just for my clients who want to return back to running, but also for those clients who just want to exercise in general. Okay, so they go on um, a, a series of, uh, of activities and exercises uh, looking at the different weeks. Okay, so what you can do and start in week zero to two, um, and they go 12 weeks and beyond as well. Um, and there's not even just exercise or a talk about exercising, but they also talk about energy levels. They talk about food consumption. They talk about compression garments that you can also be using as well. So very helpful. Okay. Um, so again, a number of our different our, our clients will also come into the clinic and kind of wonder or let me know that I've been doing my Kegels. My doctor told me to do Kegels and you know what, I've done them and they're just not working. So there's many reasons why um, my Kegels or pelvic floor contractions uh, may not be working. 
okay? Um, and usually because there's not as many sensory nerves or what they call mechanoreceptors in that pelvic floor um, region. Um, so sometimes there's um, not as, uh, as good um, awareness, okay? And also because we can't see those muscles. So um, typically say if we're looking at our bicep, which is that muscle in the front of the arm, you know, we can see it, we can touch it. And typically most people can't see their pelvic floor muscles. So they're just not aware of them, okay? Um, as we've mentioned before, sometimes there's scar tissue. So scar tissue in the vaginal area, scar tissue in the abdominal region. So when we have that scar tissue, what it does is it can actually adhere to the tissue below it. So that tissue may get stuck um, and then it may not move well. So what we need to do is teach you how to, or you can do this, um, you know, start to get some of that, that scar tissue moving. That will help to uh, allow the muscle below and the tissues below to start to contract and relax a bit more appropriately. Um, and it also um, uh, with movement as well. Okay. Um, another reason why um, people may not uh, find that their uh, Kegels are working is uh, because of the presence of rectus diastasis. Okay. So rectus diastasis is um, where uh, there's an opening or a gapping um, of the abdominal muscles. Um, and what I want to I want everybody to understand is that this is normal as we get older or and have babies. Sorry, it's not normal as we get older. Um, what I meant to say is that this is uh, typical as we actually progress within our pregnancy. Um, and so and it also actually becomes more common the more children that we have. Okay. So typically that gap will remain a little bit wider um, at about six, till about six weeks, but it should start to close. If the um, gap or the tension within that rectus diastasis is not created and starting to close, um, people may demonstrate um, issues with their pelvic floor, so they may start to complain of urinary incontinence. Uh, they may talk about uh, back pain. Okay, so what we know though is that we, we definitely want to be creating some tension within the linea alba, um, which is the elastic band, which is between those two abdominal muscles so that we can improve your abdominal function as well. So this is just a diagram here. Um, so the linea alba is um, like an elastic band that kind of sits in between the rectus um, abdominis and those are our six pack abs. And what we know is that the um, sometimes or uh, with uh, when we're pregnant, um, this definitely has to uh, expand and to stretch to allow for um, accommodation of your growing baby. Okay, so again, it's definitely normal um, as we have babies and the more babies that we do have. The important thing to understand though is that when um, when this tissue does get stretched out, we really need to rehab that abdominal wall as well. Okay. Think about um, rehab when we're talking about pelvic floor and that abdominal wall as just as um, you know, if you had surgery for your knee, or had an ACL tear, you would actually be into physiotherapy to actually rehab it. Same thing when you're actually, um, you know, when you have a baby, just think that you've been carrying this load for nine months. Um, if you've had a C-section, they've cut through your abdominal muscles. So essentially what we want to do is make sure that those muscles are getting nice and strong so that they can support you throughout your life. Okay, um, Kegels or pelvic floor contractions are not a one size fits all. Um, as we talked about, um, you know, pelvic floor contractions should be performed in those individuals who have lengthened or weakened pelvic floor muscles, right? So as we mentioned again, it's that hypotonic muscles, okay? Hypertonic muscles, which are those muscles that are tight um, and short, we want to make sure that we teach um, people how to lengthen those muscles before we start doing uh, some contractions. Um, so, you know, we teach them how to reverse or relax their pelvic floor, okay? Um, we must do that pelvic floor or that internal exam just to determine what that resting tone is of the muscles. And then this also allows us to demonstrate or to, to really understand whether you're doing those contractions properly, okay? Um, we also know that um, we have to address some of those external um, tissues um, because those external tissues can also affect contraction. Um, and we also need to address some of the global and lifestyle um, issues. So sleep, nutrition, and exercise, these are all important components um, to um, how our pelvic health is maintained. Okay, so when we talk about treatment, um, we talk a lot about education. So education is key here. Um, as I just mentioned, we wanna look at those lifestyle factors. Um, we need to understand what 
symptoms um, that you're having that have brought you into the into the clinic. We want to understand what your goal is, right? Um, and then what we want to do is after those um, that initial assessment is we want to really make sure that you understand how the bladder is functioning, um, any sort of behavior modification that we need to do. We need to um, identify any bladder irritants. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we want to understand what your treatment goals are. Um, we will then look to do any sort of pelvic floor uh, training or up training or down training. Um, we want to make sure that you understand your anatomy. The more you understand, um, the more you're able to, um, to connect with those muscle groups. Okay, we then want to, along with training the pelvic floor, train those outer muscles, outer unit muscles. Um, we may have to do a bit of manual therapy where uh, we get our hands on you if we find some stiffness in your hips, your low back or your pelvis, or sometimes even in your mid back. Um, and on the odd occasion, uh, we sometimes will use um, electrical stimulation or biofeedback. So sometimes my clients, when we've worked um, together, we've kind of addressed, say, some of the soft tissue and we're working on cues to connect with the pelvic the floor. Sometimes our clients just can't get that contraction. So what we sometimes will use is this biofeedback machines or electrical stim, where it actually helps to teach the clients how to contract their muscles if they're not able to do so. Okay. So uh, just some tips as we're finishing up on some good bowel and bladder care. Um, so uh, sometimes our clients, um, because of incontinence issues, they tend not to drink. Okay. Um, what we want to really understand is that if we're not drinking um, enough water and keeping ourselves hydrate, we can actually irritate our bladder, which can actually make it become a little bit more overactive. So we want to tell people to make sure that they're consuming about six to eight, um, six to eight cups of uh, fluid or water uh, a day, unless otherwise advised by your doctor. You want to try to spread those drinks out throughout the day. So what I normally get my clients to do is fill, you know, a 36 ounce um, um, water bottle up that they can sink, uh, sip throughout the day. Um, you want to try to cut down on sugary and caffeinated beverages. Um, I try never to say never to caffeine, um, but usually what I'll recommend is that if you're having incontinence issues is, you know, stop that caffeine um, or drink prior to 12 o'clock um, in the afternoon um, and try to avoid it after that time. Okay, you want to make sure that you're eating a healthy diet. So it's really important to eat lots of fiber. So lots of green leafy vegetables. And that pretty much sounds pretty consistent uh, across the board from what, uh, what we're hearing these days. Um, we want to make sure that we're active. So we want to try to aim for 30 minutes of exercise regularly. Um, it's about 150 minutes a week of cardiovascular exercise and two times a week of strength training. Um, and those are based on the, um, the WHO guidelines. Okay, uh, for individuals who are 18 years and over. Okay, and then we want to start to practice good toileting habits. So we want to make sure that we go to the toilet when we have that urge to go. So don't push it off. Okay, and try not to get into that habit, as I mentioned earlier, if that, you know, go just in case. And that applies to our kids as well. And I've definitely very much of a culprit of that when we were going on those long car rides, we would tell the kids not to go or go to the washroom just in case because we were going on that long car ride and they, you know, they'd always fight you because they didn't have to go. So like I said, trying to avoid those things because again, we can retrain our, uh, our bladder to actually start to go a bit more frequently. Um, one of the big things we see with lots of our clients and especially those 80s babies, um, <laughs> I say, or those 70s babies where we got told to kind of suck our abdominals in um, because it would train our abdominals and keep them in tone. Um, just uh, remember that when we do suck those abdominal muscles in, we'll also increase our pressure within our pelvic floor um, area. Um, and so if that, if we imp increase our pressure in that pelvic floor, it can also lead to pelvic organ prolapse as well. Um, so we want to make sure that those uh, abdominal muscles are relaxed. Okay, so try to let those relax as you're um, as you're standing, you're sitting, and same thing when you're doing your exercises. So when that core is functioning appropriately, we shouldn't actually think about suck, sucking those muscles in. Okay. Um, and then the final thing, um, because sometimes we'll, we'll get people who recommend uh, practicing going, uh, stopping the flow of urine on the toilet. So again, um, as I explained how that bladder works, we want to make sure that we're not practicing our pelvic floor muscle crack contractions on that toilet, because what happens again is that we can train that bladder to make sure uh, to uh, 
contract and relax as we're going to the washroom and, or, and the pelvic floor muscles. So we wanna make sure that we don't start and stop that flow of urine uh, when really we should be teaching those muscles that they just need to relax to empty out that bladder. All right. Um, so um, that is our talk for tonight. Um, again, I do apologize for, uh, for the mix-up that we had yesterday. Um, so I hope that was informative. Um, what I've done um, up on the screen is um, just left either um, our Georgetown at Aramosa email or the Acton at Aramosa email. So if any of you have any questions, feel free to uh, send us an email. Uh, maybe just put in a tagline, um, you know, pelvic health questions re regarding the webinar. Okay, so hopefully um, everybody had a good night. Um, take care.